welcome everybody and thank you for um, participating tonight and, and enjoying this program along with us. Uh, again, it's sponsored by the Holland Township Free Public Library. And we are delighted tonight and honored to have uh, Victoria Dole with us. Uh, Vicki is a Rutgers certified master gardener in Hunterdon County, where she's lived for more than 30 years. Uh, she has a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry and over 40 years experience in research and development of con consumer products. Although retired, she continues to nurture a lifelong passion for science, gardening, and learning. Welcome, Vicki. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I, I hope that you've had your dinner and uh, are comfortable and ready to listen to this presentation about growing vegetables in containers. But before I start, I wanted to share this slide with you, uh, which tells you a little bit about the Master Gardener program here in Hunterdon County. Uh, we are a group of volunteers and we are here to serve the community. Uh, unfortunately, of course, right now we are closed, um, but if we were open, uh, you could come to our building we are right across the library on Route 12. Um, when you come in, you just make a, the first ride and we are the last building. And if you have issues with your plants, uh, you can either call us um, or come in in person, you know, bring samples and we can, we try to diagnose what the issues are. So that's one of the main things that we do. And we start, you know, in the spring and we finish up in the autumn. So we're right there to help you during the growing season. Um, we also do other programs with schools. Um, we, uh, we have uh, an experimental farm right here in Hunterdon County, which is run by Rutgers. And um, much of the harvest uh, goes to food pantry. So that's really, really nice. And, um, and we also do these types of presentations uh, for the community. Um, so tonight we're gonna talk about growing vegetables in containers. And it's the perfect time to do that. And let me see if I can advance my slide because it doesn't seem to want to be doing it. Let's see now. Okay, here we are. So it looks like it's working. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, container uh, gardening. And it's the perfect time of the year because now you, now you should go out and start buying your seedlings and start planting them. So I'm so happy to be here uh, this time of the month because um, it's the perfect time. And, and in fact, I just, uh, put in a couple of tomatoes um, this weekend. Um, last year was very difficult because with all of us being home, there were very few plants you could buy. And um, I didn't get such a large vegetable garden put in, um, but um, you know, go out now and, and see what you can find. Uh, so we're gonna talk about a lot of different things, but first of all, let's, let's discuss why should you grow vegetables in containers? Well, it's a wonderful way to grow vegetables. Um, when uh, you can't do it in a normal garden. Um, so you can, you know, your deck, your balcony, your patio. Um, and of course in Hunterdon County, we have such terrible soil. It's very, there's a lot of clay in our soil. Uh, so it's very difficult to, to put in a vegetable garden unless you put in a lot of soil amendments. So putting them in pots is an easier way to grow your vegetables. And it's a great solution uh, for people that, that live in rental homes. Um, my son uh, rents an apartment and um, the first thing he did was, um, you know, he and his wife, uh, they put in some vegetables on their balcony. And of course, as we get a little older, you know, maybe we don't wanna be bending down so much. And so having them in pots, um, it's a little bit easier. Uh, and also if you don't wanna maintain a big garden, you know, this is, doesn't take much to grow some vegetables. And finally, you need very few tools, just, um, you know, some gloves, a little spade, you know, a little watering can, and you are all set. So what we're gonna call, talk about today is a lot of different things, containers and more containers, because that's the fun part of growing vegetables that way, because there's so many containers to choose from. We will also talk about the soil. I will talk briefly about the plants themselves. And then we will talk about what the veggies need to grow well, things like water, sun, and nutrients. And then finally, we'll touch upon uh, when the plants need a little extra care. You know, uh, they're not gonna be immune to bugs and diseases, unfortunately. So we need to keep an eye on them and make sure that they're growing well. 
Um, I have a great resource for you. Uh, when I did this research, I borrowed this book from the library and uh, I thought it was so good that I decided to buy one um, and you can get it used, you know, so here, here it is. Um, I, um, I found it uh, used and uh, you can do the same. It's only about six, $7, but it's a wonderful resource to have on hand um, when you start growing your vegetable this way and we'll help you answer some questions. Um, at the end, if we were seeing each other in person, I would be able to give you this handout also. And unfortunately, since we're not, uh, at the end of the presentation, um, I will uh, give you um, the number. Uh, Rutgers puts out what are called fact sheets. And this particular one, which um, talks about container gardening is F is in Frank, S as Sam. 055. So you just have to go on the internet and type in Rutgers fact sheets and you will get um, this particular one. And there's other ones too that I will mention at the end um, that uh, will give you tips on how to, um, you know, take care of your plants a little bit better. So containers, um, it's, they're only limited by your own imagination. And here what I'm showing is uh, three different type of containers. Of course, you know, we got the whimsical, um, a clay pot here on the left. Um, but what's very interesting is the fact that, you know, these vegetables are being grown in a five gallon plastic container. And the bigger the container, the better for veggies. And here uh, are some, uh, some other containers. Um, and in fact, you can buy these, you don't have to buy these heavy wooden ones. You can even get the plastic versions of these barrels. Um, they can be, your containers can be simply functional or you can use them to tie them to your uh, landscape or to the theme of your house. You know, if you like more traditional type of pots, you can get those or, you know, whatever you like. But the things to keep, the things to keep in mind though would be, of course, the shape of your pot, the size, the color, and the material. So we're gonna cover each of these because some are more important than others, of course. Uh, let us start with the size. Now, the container has to be large enough to fit your plant. And what I'm giving you here is a chart. And it's, it makes sense, of course, because some of the plants that are bigger uh, will need larger containers. So I've highlighted in red things like eggplant, peppers, squash, and tomato. And they all need about a five gallon container to grow one plant. Uh, what I'm showing here is basil in a two gallon container. And to me, after I took the picture, I realized this is a little crowded. I mean, you don't want this kind of crowded plants in a pot, but I do use a lot of basil in the summer. So I would, I would probably snip this very quickly, allowing the plants to grow from below. So it wouldn't be as crowded. Um, if you wanted to grow just very small containers, of course, you could have things like a lettuce and you only need just um, a gallon container to grow uh, a couple of lettuce plants. So it's really all up to you. Uh, of course, the benefits of having larger containers is that they require less watering. And the one thing when you're growing vegetables in pots, just like flowers, you have to make the commitment to be out there every day and water your plants because they do need the water, especially in the summertime. And I typically go out, um, you know, first thing in the morning, 7.30, 8 o'clock, when it's still a little bit cool, and I'll water all my, all my vegetables. Um, I have a deck, a very large deck, where I plant my vegetables, and uh, I do have the water source right there in the deck, which makes it very, very easy for me. Um, you know, your situation is particularly good for the plants. Um, so, you know, if you can, try to buy the lighter containers, um, the lighter color containers, that is, um, because it'll be better for the plants. And uh, let us now look at the particular material of each of the plants. We'll start with plastic because that is the most vers versatile. It's very light. Um, you know, you could shape it in many different kinds of shapes. Um, but let us look at it in a different way. So we all know our recycling symbols, of course, right? We all recycle. So I've just listed some of the numbers here that um, we're looking at when we um, put our containers in our recycling bin. Um, so uh, number one, of course, we know is PET, which is the water and the soda bottles. And if you're lucky enough to get one of those big water jugs, why not use them for planting your vegetables? Uh, number two is 
um, high density polyethylene. And that's typically the milk jugs, the gallon milk jugs. It's a softer material, uh, but you certainly could use a milk jug to grow your vegetables if you don't wanna buy a pot. Um, number four um, just refers to our plastic bags and they're really not very useful, but if you wanted to line a pot with a plastic bag, why not? And uh, finally, number five is polypropylene. And I'm sure you've seen some of those uh, this year. Um, most of our to-go food comes in these uh, polypropylene because it's a harder plastic and you could actually microwave it. And these food containers would make uh, great seedling starters. Um, so if you get them and you're thinking next year, you might wanna start some seeds um, yourself rather than buying the plants, um, these food containers would be great to use. Um, one thing to remember is that if the container is okay for food, of course it's gonna be contain, it's gonna be okay to grow your plants. So if you're reusing a container, make sure that it's a container that had food in it and not something that could be potentially toxic. I mean, that's common sense. Um, I wanna tell you about my favorite plastic container. Uh, before I became a master gardener, um, I received as a gift a composter. You see, oh, you see it over here on the left. Mine did, did not quite look like this, um, but I realized that it really wasn't working. So it was just sitting around and I decided that um, I should try using it to grow vegetables in it. So mine kind of split right in the middle. And um, so I, I started growing things in it. So you can see here, I have bush beans and uh, sugar snap peas. And what I love about these containers is that they're big. Each half is, I think around 12 to 15 gallons. So you can grow quite a bit of vegetables in it. So if you have things like this around your house that might be useful, think about using them for your vegetables. Um, another one, which is very inexpensive, if you don't wanna spend a lot of money for your containers, is the one I'm showing here. And you typically see these you know, around July, August, um, at the big box stores. When the kids are getting ready to go back to school, uh, you see a lot of these containers in many, many colors. Um, great for them to take to their dorms to put all their stuff in, throw it under the bed, but they make a great um, container for uh, vegetables. Um, but you just have to line it because they do have these great big holes. And so you just buy um, some gardening fabric and uh, shape it and put it in and then add your soil to it. They're wonderful because they're lightweight. Uh, they have, of course, lots of drainage. Um, they're fairly large. I think these run about five, five gallons. And because of all these holes, they heat and cool quickly. So the roots are not damaged in very, very sunny locations. So that's something you might want to consider. Um, you know, you may not be able to buy these yet, but you know, next year, uh, around July, August timeframe, go to those stores and, and buy a few of these. Um, clay and fiber pots. Of course, clay pots are beautiful. They're natural, um, they're appealing, they have these wonderful designs on them, but they're really quite heavy. Also, if you buy them unglazed, they are quite porous and the soil will dry out quickly. Of course, they're much heavier than plastic pots too. Uh, one alternative um, would be a fiber pot. And here I'm showing a fiber pot, and I have a few of these, and they last a long time. Um, they are more expensive, uh, but they do resemble clay pots. As you can see, they have designs on them, and so it's an investment to get these kind of pots, um, but uh, they're light, they're pretty. Um, so if you like something that looks a little bit more natural, these might be something you could consider. And what I'm growing in this pot is a um, patio tomato. I think the patio tomatoes are really a good choice because they're shorter, they're stockier, uh, you don't have to stake them. Um, and so it's a wonderful uh, choice for um, growing in, in the pots. Wood containers. Um, this is the final container I'm gonna talk about. Um, they're also really wonderful. Now you could buy them or you could build them yourself if there's someone in your home or yourself uh, that can do this. Uh, think about using um, untreated wood if you're going to do that, uh, something natural. Uh, cedar, redwood is a good choice because of the uh, pine oils in there. Uh, they will help to keep the bugs away and also will last a little bit longer. 
um, you do have to treat them and you need to use uh, a stain or a seal, um, which is safe for food. So uh, let me show you the container that I have on my deck because I have a very large deck so I can buy these containers. I, in fact, I bought one and then I went ahead and bought a second one. Um, it is an investment, they are expensive and you can see this is what it looks like brand new. It's a unique design. You can see here, it kind of looks like a V uh, which allows you to put the very tall plants in the center because they, they'll have the, you know, the most soil. Uh, so for example, you might consider putting your tomatoes in the center and then on the outside, uh, smaller plants such as lettuce or herbs. Um, so this is, this is a nice uh, container if you wanna spend that kind of money. Uh, and here, because they're so big, I decided to grow zucchini one year. And you certainly cannot do that in a regular pot unless you buy like a bush zucchini plant. Uh, this is a regular zucchini and they are quite dramatic when you plant them because the, um, the, the planter is, you know, comes to the waist level. So you're kind of getting really close to them and you see these large leaves and they're really quite decorative. Um, another time I put in uh, the beans and the peas in it. So you, you can put a lot of vegetables in these containers. Now, I've talked about getting large containers, but what happens when your space is limited? And I look to this photograph to give you inspiration because this is a beautiful photograph of Cinque Terre in Italy. And I hope some of you have been there, uh, but you can see people live down here by the sea and then behind them, you know, they have this very steep hill. So what the people have done is they've actually planted on this hill. And so um, this should be an inspiration for us. So if you have a very small balcony, Think about doing something like this. Um, you could either, again, have something like this built, uh, tiered, or you could buy some of these uh, tiered things. Um, they're metal. And then you can um, put your vegetables um, vertically. That way, if you don't have a lot of horizontal space, you can go vertically. Uh, just keep in mind that you probably want your tomatoes, the taller plants at the top. Uh, that way, they don't take away the sunlight from the ones underneath. Um, so the smaller plants towards the bottom, the taller plants to the top. So that's one option if you just have a very small, you know, it has to drain freely. So it has to be lightweight. And it also has to hold moisture because you don't want to just be watering your plant and then immediately it's going to dry out. Um, you should never use soil from your yard. Um, it is too dense and it will not drain properly or allow for aeration, which is very important from growing vegetables. Um, and in Hunter County, as I mentioned earlier, our soil, there's a lot of clay in our soil. So it's very, very heavy. It's really not a good option. Also, if you bring it into your pot, um, you could be introducing uh, diseases such as fungi or insects and weeds, of course. Uh, so you don't want those in your container because you know, once you plant your plants, you don't wanna be weeding them. And, and uh, so you don't have to do that. Um, here is an option if you want to buy it. Um, of course, you probably recognize what, the, what this is, even though I tried to take the name away. Uh, but this one, um, uh, not only is it a good light mixture, but it also contains um, a fertilizer built in so that you don't have to initially fertilize uh, your plants. Um, also, I want to show you the back label. Um, so it's basically peat moss um, and then uh, perlite, which is... Um, an ingredient which allows moisture to be held, uh, and then the fertilizer. And you can see here the, the fertilizer analysis. So it has nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium. So it's, it's a good choice. Um, if you can handle the larger bags, of course, they're gonna be more cost-effective. Um, but if you don't wanna do that, uh, you could also try making your own. And here is the recipe. And, um, you will see this recipe in the Rutgers fact sheet. So basically what you need is vermiculite and vermiculite is a mineral. Uh, you can see it here, uh, I have a picture of it. It's basically a mineral uh, which is heated up to very, very high temperatures and it takes on this sponge-like appearance. And in between this sponge, it will hold a lot of water. So it will keep uh, your plant moist throughout the day. You will also need the peat moss 
Um, and then of course the fertilizer, uh, some limestone because peat moss tends to be on the acidic side and we want our plants to have a, a neutral kind of soil. So we don't want them to be too acidic. So we do add some limestone in. And then of course uh, we add in our fertilizer. And I gave you like a little cheat sheet here, which tells you a bushel is about eight gallons. I tried doing this, I made it once. It gets a little messy. Um, and um, you know, the, the peat moss comes in these huge contain, huge, you know, bricks, they're humongous. So you might not be using all of these ingredients um, at once. So you would need a place to store them. Um, I think buying the soil is much easier um, and you don't have to throw it out after the season. Um, you can save it, uh, but you will lose some of it. So you will have to replenish some the following year. Um, I did notice this year uh, when I was, um, I had some soil in some of the pots. Um, in fact, a couple of the pots, I just left them on the deck and I, I emptied the pot because I, I thought the pot needed to be painted again. And when I emptied the soil, I realized that in the soil, there were a bunch of grubs. So that is something that you need to check if you keep it. I didn't realize that they were gonna be in there, but um, you know, grubs are gonna eat your vegetables. I mean, they're voracious eaters. And you know, grubs are those nasty little creatures that become beetles. So if you do keep your soil from year to year, just take a look at it and make sure there are no, no grubs in it, as I noticed this year. Um, so now let us talk about the plants. Um, of course, a lot of this is common sense. Select the proper variety that are suitable for your container. So obviously you don't want anything which is too tall or too wide. So you can't really grow that zucchini I showed you in a small pot. That's, it just keeps growing across. And you can't grow sweet corn either because it's too tall. Uh, but certainly there's a variety of plants that you can grow. Uh, when you buy your plants, or if you want to start from seeds, it's really up to you. Um, I don't usually grow things from seeds. I don't, I don't have the setup, you know, with the grow lights and all that. So I tend to buy my, my plants. Um, although this year I did put some seeds, um, I did try some seeds and I put them on a, a very sunny window that I have and they're coming up, um, but um, it's much easier to, to buy the, the plants. Um, when you buy the transplants um, or the seeds, make sure they're resistant to common diseases. <coughs> Excuse me. And when you buy your transplants, make sure they're stocky. They should not be flowering. So if you're buying your tomatoes and you already see some flowers on them, you know, that's like a stress situation. So you, you're better off buying the ones that are a little bit smaller, a little bit stockier. Uh, they'll grow better for you. Although, you know, I can't help myself. I, sometimes I buy the flowering ones too. Ah, so here we are. Here's a list of things you can grow. And the ones in green are things that I've tried and seem to work very well. Um, lettuce, beans, onions, peppers, radishes, uh, squash, eggplants, Swiss chards, and of course, tomatoes. Tomatoes are wonderful to grow in pots. Just make sure you don't buy ones that are too tall because then they're hard to deal with because you'll have to stake them and it's kind of hard to do in a pot. And of course, herbs. Herbs, it's wonderful to have herbs in, in your pots. Um, particularly if, if you have, like I do, um, my deck is right off my kitchen. So if I'm cooking at night and I need some herbs, I'll just go out on the deck, pick, pick a few and just you know use them in my cooking. And you could almost grow any kind of herb um, in, in your pots, whatever you like. Oh, and here's an idea. So if you um, happen to have you know, some grandchildren and you want them to get them interested in, in growing uh, vegetables, um, why don't you not you know, do a pizza garden with them? Um, you can plant all the ingredients that are great for making a pizza, such as the, the Roma tomatoes, uh, the oregano, basil, onion, and chives. So they might enjoy doing that. And in fact, um, just this weekend, um, I found, um, this tomato, which I bought, I've never tried this before. It's called Little Napoli. It's a compact Roma tomato. So um, we'll see how it works out, but I've never seen a, a small Roma tomato. So it should be good because they're gonna be a little bit meatier. 
Um, so taking care of your veggies. Um, there are some vegetables that need a lot of sunlight, uh, such as the tomatoes and the peppers, uh, about eight hours. So you need to think about that. Uh, the root vegetables, a little bit less, uh, six hours. And then uh, the leafy vegetables, because they have such large leaves, they don't need as much sunlight. Um, and so only about four hours will do it. Uh, so if you don't have a lot of sun, um, why not grow some lettuce? Lettuce is very easy to grow. Um, but no matter where you are, just keep in mind that your plants should be about 12 inches away from any stone or masonry walls because they do take in a lot of heat and you don't want to overheat your plants. So um, that's something to think about. I keep mine on my deck. Uh, and of course, you know, I have deck railing is open. So there's a lot of breeze that comes through and, and I don't have much of an issue with overheating the plants. Ah, and here are the ones that will tolerate some shade. So I wanna give you more of these. Uh, here you can see I put in lettuce in my, in my trug. Uh, and you could also buy these, this cover for the trug, which is great because then it keeps all the bugs away. So I think it came up very nicely. This particular lettuce is called Green Star. So arugula, mustard, radicchio, oregano, parsley, sage, spinach, and Swiss chard will all work very well in about four hours of sunlight. And in fact, um, the way my house is situated uh, in the front, uh, the sun rises kind of in the front of my house. And so on my deck, I don't get that very early morning sun. So next to the house is where I put my lettuce. And because then around 10 o'clock, I start getting the sun as it comes overhead. And so I keep my tomatoes in the sunnier spot. So that's something you, know, you might wanna do for yourself as well. Just think about where the sun is and where you're gonna put your pots. Um, in taking care of your veggies, I've talked about watering. You have to water very often, daily. Um, when, it's not, when it's very hot, you might wanna think about twice a day. Uh, but just you know, take a look in the morning, um, go out, water your plants early when things are cool. Always put the, wa the water at the base of your plant. You don't wanna be watering the whole plant because when the plant is wet, it will, you might have, fungus coming in, or you might have other, other things that are attacking it, other kind of diseases. So it's better to keep the plant as dry as possible. Um, when the plant starts to grow, you'll need to give it some uh, fertilizer. And the best bet is to buy a, a, a liquid uh, because the pot is so small, it's hard to figure out how much of the granules to put in. So if you just use the liquid, then it's um, a little bit easier and you're not gonna be over fertilizing it because you know, too much fertilizer is just as bad as not enough fertilizer. Um, so when the plant is small, just put in a half a tablespoon in a gallon of water of 20-20-20 fertilizer. And you'll see them at the store. They're especially uh, for vegetables. Uh, and then when the plant is about 50% in size, uh, then you would increase the rate of fertilizer to a tablespoon. Um, if you're buying your soil with the fertilizer already in there, you may not need to put any fertilizer the, that first year. Um, but then in subsequent years, as you are reusing your soil and all the fertilizer is gone, then you'll have to start using uh, this liquid fertilizer and you will see how nice the plants will look. Uh, and here's more tips. So the plants should not be crowded. So this should be air circulating among the plants. Um, I do with my pots the way people do in their vegetable garden in the yard, uh, rotate the plants to new pots. So if one year I've put a tomato in one pot, the next year I'll, I'll put something else. Um, look at your plants often. Um, and then also, you know, if you see something wrong, uh, you know, try to, diagnose what the problem is. And always, always, um, you know, you're going to all this trouble to grow your vegetables. Uh, think about alternates to chemicals whenever possible. Um, you're throwing, you know, you're growing these wonderful vegetables. Why, why would you want to give them a, a you know, a pesticide? And so this is, <laughs> leads us to this part of the presentation where I'm going to talk a little bit about when things go wrong, but hopefully you're not going to give up because you know, vegetables are fairly easy to grow. Um, so we're gonna talk first about things that happen to tomatoes. And the reason I've chosen tomatoes is because I read a statistics that 
86% of people that grow vegetables will grow tomatoes. So I figured I gotta cover the tomatoes. And so first we'll cover some cosmetic blemishes that, um, you know, it's not a disease. Uh, so for example, uh, cracking of the fruit. And you see these cracked fruits, even when you go to a vegetable stand to buy your tomatoes. And it really is, um, is caused by the, a change in temperature or a change in the moisture. So if you forget to water your tomatoes or it's raining for a week, chances are you might get some cracked tomatoes. Um, this other one I think is rather cute. It's called cat facing right here because it looks like the face of a cat. And that happens when the temperature goes below 50 degrees. It's not, it's out of our control, unfortunately, when we get a cold spell. And I do have two tomatoes on my deck and I hope we don't get a frost because tomatoes don't like it cold. So when it gets cold, stuff like this could happen. Some tomato varieties are more prone to these cosmetic uh, type of issues, particularly the bigger ones. Um, but you may not see too much of this because we're certainly not gonna be growing beefsteak tomatoes in our pots. Um, my recommendation would be to plant the smaller ones like the cherry tomatoes, the grape tomatoes, um, the um, patio tomatoes, things like that. And so you, will, you probably won't see this, these issues. But let me give you one more, a couple more actually. Um, this is called yellow shoulder. Uh, again, it's caused by cool and wet condition. And you can see what happens on the inside. Also, if the pH is too high, uh, because I mentioned earlier, generally vegetables like a neutral pH. Uh, pH too high means there's too much lime in the soil. Um, it shouldn't happen if you're buying a, uh, a ready-made uh, soil mix. But just in case, you know, if you decide to put in your own fertilizer and you see this, it might be that the pH is too high or the potassium level is too low. Um, this is rather interesting. It's called zippering uh, and it looks like a zipper. No one knows why it happens, uh, but uh, we see it more in the large tomato variety and the heirloom tomatoes, just like we see the cracking. So uh, we should not see this in the smaller variety that you may be typically growing on your, on your patio. Uh, blossom end rot is common. Um, and you can see what it looks like. Um, it's uh, a patch, uh, dark brown. Uh, it may become sunken, like in the case here, or you would, might see it on the inside of the eggplant. Again, this is caused by the fluctuation of moisture, uh, which affects the uptake of the nutrient by the plant. And so this is how the plant is reacting. So um, let's make sure that we always uh, check our plants and uh, give them the water that they need. And hopefully we won't get like a, a rainy summer with water all the time, which is out of our control. There's not much we could do for that. Um, here is one which is a, a very serious type of disease. This is a disease, uh, anthracnose. It doesn't just affect our vegetables. It also affects our plants in our landscape. But in terms of vegetables, um, tomato, eggplant, pepper, and potato are affected by it. And you will see a sunken spot on a ripe fruit, and then this spot enlarges to a bullseye. And let me show you what it looks like on the tomato. It starts out really small, a little blemish like this, uh, then it becomes larger, and then you will see the evidence on the inside. You will see the rot. Um, unfortunately, this is a fungus, um, and it thrives in wet and very humid weather. Um, there is no resistant variety, so you can't buy a plant that will resist this. Uh, you can apply a, fungus, a fungicide. Uh, however, um, if you get it, um, do not keep the soil uh, for the following year uh, because this disease does remain in the soil. It doesn't die out in the winter. And also if um, some people collect their seeds, um, do not collect the seeds either because the seeds will have the disease on it. Um, so this is something to think about, the anthracnose. Um, powdery mildew, this is a little bit more common, unfortunately. And, you know, our summers are very hot and humid here in Hunterdon County. And so we are going to get some powdery mildew. Um, and here's what it looks like on tomato. Uh, and it affects particularly cucumbers and squash. 
uh, you will see this powdery um, uh, stuff on the, on the leaves. Uh, it is caused by a fungus and the spore is spread by the wind, uh, but you do need the humid condition. So if it happens to be a very humid summer, you may see more of this. Um, and to try to avoid it again, do not water your plants, um, give good air circulation to your plants. Um, you could try some horticultural oil to prevent it. Or if it gets really bad, you could, you could apply a fungicide. Uh, but molten, normally, um, the powdery mildew doesn't really kill the plant. So keep an eye on it if that, if that happens uh, to your plants. Ah, so this is um, my, my back deck. I wanted to talk about bugs now. So um, this is a, a little above ground pool that um, we put in when my son was um, four years old. And the intention was to remove it um, when he outgrew it. Well, here it is still there. And here are my plants around it. But a couple of years ago, something very interesting happened. I mean, of course, people that have a pool, you know, you always get bugs in them. But this particular summer, I had tons and tons of beetles that fell in the pool. So I was very concerned about the beetles eating my plants, uh, but they didn't touch the plants. So I'm thinking that having the plants around the pool is a good thing because the bugs fall in and they don't eat my plants. So I'm calling this my bug magnet. So let us talk about bugs. Um, some of the common pests that will affect our vegetables because even though they're in pots, it doesn't mean that um, they're immune to pests because they're not. Um, aphids, um, if you get aphids, you're gonna get thousands and thousands of aphids because um, the way they work is that a female will land on a plant and will deposit a baby. And you can see the baby at this end right here. Um, and then they multiply. The best way to get rid of it is to just spray it. Spray your plant, high pressure water, and they will, they will go away. Because these, these bugs at this point, they don't have any wings, so they're not gonna fly back on, on your plant. So just wash them away. Uh, beetles, if you see beetles, and you're gonna see beetles because you know, we got plenty of them here uh, in the summer. Uh, just look at your plants, wear gloves, pick them off, throw them away. Um, I'm also listing the Rutgers fact sheets right here um, that uh, will give you more information. So I'll leave um, this slide for, you know, a few seconds so you can write some of these numbers down. The one bug that I absolutely hate is a hornworm. I'm sure you've seen these guys. They are nasty. They start eating your tomato plant. And in a matter of a day, they've demo they will demolish your tomato. So if you see them, they're hard to spot because they're green, just like the tomato. Uh, just pick them off and get rid of them. Um, and there's also a, a fact sheet about it. And finally, um, if you're gonna plant cucumbers or squash, um, squash borers are fairly common. Um, usually you'll see them around July, August time frame. If you see them, just um, you know, cut them out, get rid of the, the branches um, because they're going to probably kill your plant. Um, and I've seen them on my zucchini, unfortunately. Uh, but as you can see here, I've given you um, solutions without using pesticide because this is um, you know what we do at Rutgers. We don't really you know condone using of pesticides because. Pesticides should not even be called pesticides. They should be called insecticides because not only will they kill the bad bugs, but they may kill the good bugs. So let me show you a few good bugs that you should welcome in your garden, um, the beneficial insects. And I'm showing you some pictures of them. Um, lacewing, uh, the, the lacewing will eat aphids, mites, mealybugs, and scales. Uh, dragonflies are wonderful. And, if you happen to have a little pool like I do, uh, they will zip across the pool and they will eat flying insects. They're really fun to watch. Uh, ladybugs, of course, the lady beetles will eat lots of little bugs too. And here's what their eggs look like. Uh, the praying mantis, of course, they are voracious eaters. Um, here is, uh, I'm showing you a picture of a Chinese uh, mantis uh, egg mass. Spiders, of course, are good. The garden spiders are very colorful. Um, 
and wheel bugs. I've never seen a wheel bug, but they also eat insects and eggs. And they're called a wheel bug because um, they got this little funny back that looks like a wheel. And finally, there is a solution um, for our nasty hornworm. Uh, the braconid wasp will literally eat it alive. So um, here is a picture with the, um, um, the white cocoon of the braconid wasp and they will just eat it. Um, so you can leave them alone if you see them like this. Um, I, I've never seen them myself. I have just seen these ugly creatures getting fat and eating my tomato. So I usually pick them off if I spot one. And of course, um, you may have to share your harvest with the wildlife. Um, there are birds that will eat your tomatoes, unfortunately. Uh, my deck is five feet off the ground. And one day I did happen to see a friendly groundhog on my deck. Um, of course, if you have a patio and it's on the ground, you might have deer coming up to it. Um, let me show you what the damage looks like. So if you have squirrels, chipmunks, and raccoon eating your tomato, uh, it would look like this. Um, the birds are more um, pick-like um, when they're eating. Uh, I've tried like a whirly gig, and it seems to help a little bit. So if you put something shiny uh, where your plants are, it might... Um, I don't know if it's going to totally eradicate animals eating, um, but at least slows them down a little bit. So that's one thing you could try. The one year they were the worst was the year I planted very, very sweet cherry tomatoes. And they just love cherry tomatoes because they're so sweet. Uh, but then once I put the whirly gig on, it seemed to um, retard them a little bit. So I didn't have as many um, of my tomatoes being chewed by birds. Um, so I'll show you really quickly what I planted. Um, and I just love this eggplant. Uh, unfortunately, I, I couldn't find it last year. And I, I looked this year and I didn't find it either as a plant. And so this is the one I'm trying to start from a seed to see if it's going to work for me. But um, you can see it's a beautiful plant, beautiful purple flowers, and it's perfect for a pot. And you get these very tender uh, white eggplants that are delicious and they mature in uh, 60 to 70 days. Uh, and of course, as I said earlier, they do require uh, a five gallon container. Uh, the, the zucchini, of course, uh, which I wouldn't recommend unless you have a big um, container. And here's a picture um, of the, the zucchini that I grew. Um, the patio tomatoes, I, I think they're very good because they're very compact, very strong, and uh, they don't even need staking. Um, we saw this before with the um, green beans and the sugar snap peas in my compost bin. Um, the beans mature pretty quickly. So if you wanted to extend your bean um, harvest, you may want to stagger uh, the planting. So plant a few um, uh, beans um, one week and then plant, plant a few more another week so you could have them throughout the whole season. Um, I already put some, some beans in, in my truck uh, a couple of days ago. Um, garlic is fun to grow. I don't know if any of you have grown garlic. I never grew it until I saw some of my garlic that was um, starting to sprout. Uh, so I just literally put it in the, in the pot and you can pick them early um, when they're still young or you can let them stay until the autumn and pick, pick the bulb. And, they're so much better than what you can buy at the store. So garlic is really, really delicious. Um, so just to recap, I think we've covered everything already. We talked about the containers, the soil, the plants, um, what they require, and we talked about bugs and diseases. So I, I hope I gave you um, enough information to get you started. I hope you are excited to start uh, to grow some vegetables uh, this year. Uh, now is the time like I said, the stores have lots and lots of plants. Uh, go out, um, try a few things, see, see what you like, and, and, and grow, some, grow some vegetables and pots. Um, let us see. I think uh, I gave you um, the book. Uh, and uh, here are the uh, numbers for the fact sheets. Um, this is uh, vegetable diseases um, and it's FS1124. The one which I think is a good one is this one, which is the FS055. 
the container gardening with vegetables. And this will also give you, I think it gives you the recipe for, for, um, for uh, creating your soil mix yourself. Um, there's one about vegetables and insect control, which, F, which is FS1123. Uh, and so um, I think that's it. Uh, I wanna thank you uh, for listening to the presentation this evening. As um, soon as we reopen our, uh, our master gardener, um, you certainly can give us a call. I have the, the number listed here, 788-1338. Um, and I'm open to any questions that you may have this evening. Have any questions? Uh, just unmute yourselves. Uh, yeah, there we go. Let me just go through the list here. You mentioned, um, Vicki, that you could bring a soil sample in uh, when you do reopen and uh, have it tested. Oh, absolutely. Um, what we can do is um, we. Um, yeah, you have to take the soil and we will give you the, uh, the form to fill out. Um, it will give you instructions on how to select the soil in, in your garden. Um, you know, you have to go in different spots um, and then you, you create, you combine um, everything together, all the different soil samples. And they, it comes with uh, an envelope uh, that you can, um, with the address of where to send it at Rutgers. And um, you will get back the information. It depends the time of year, I mean, um, the earlier the better because then you know right now I, I, I don't even know how busy they are in terms of uh, uh, testing the soil but it they will give you a recommendation if you have to add lime to your soil and things like that so it'll give you a good um, a good indication of the type of soil you have yes okay good anybody else just um just unmute yourself and uh or you can put something in the chat box either one Anybody have questions? Has anyone started the garden and had problems with it? <laughs> Yeah, actually, I do have a question. Great. I just want to say thank you so much. This has been a really helpful and informative presentation. Um, so I have not had any luck trying to grow basil. Um, I think it gets too much sunlight and then it kind of tends to shrivel up and it's not like a really nice green color. It'll get very pale and the leaves will be small. Um, do you have any tips with that? Okay, I, I do in fact. Um, let me, um, I think what you're experiencing could be a disease on the basil. Um, I took out that particular slide because I was concerned about the time, the timing of this presentation. Um, but um, I experienced the same thing. So I looked into it and there is um, a disease that affects basil, uh, basil downy mildew or something like that. Um, Rutgers did a lot of work on basil. And um, in fact, uh, they found um, several varieties that are resistant to this, um, this disease. Um, the best bet would be to, and then they, they worked with a seed company uh, so that you could buy the seeds, um, Johnny's. Uh, so I suspect that what the problem is, is not so much that I think it's, you're getting um, the basil, which might be prone to this disease. And it, the best bet would be to buy this. I mean, resistant variety doesn't mean you're going to be free of it, but at least it'll give you a better chance. Um, do you, do you, are you able to get any basil at all in the beginning or does it go directly to the yellowing stage? Um, it looks good at the beginning. Like when I buy it, it's, you know, it got the big green, you know, the dark leaves, but then I just feel like it tends to get like all like wilted and, yeah. and like very, very tall. I try to cut it down. It doesn't really help too much. Yeah. It might be that it might be one of those type, one of those that are not, that might get that, that disease. So um, yeah, if you, if you wanted to try the one from Rutgers, uh, you could buy a packet of seeds from Johnny and see if that works better for you. Because okay. this, this disease is pretty prevalent. It's been around and I know it affected mine as well. And um, I tried um, this particular one. Um, let me see if I can find the slide. Hold on for a second. Okay. 
Ah, there it is. Wait, 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 wait. Come on, come on. Wait a minute. Let me see. Let's see if I can find the slide. And I could give you the name of the basil downy mildew. Here it is. So these are the ones that Rutgers found that were more, um, yeah, it's called basil downy mildew. And if you, you can look at the back of the, the basil leaves and you start seeing this, this, this um, color here like that. And, and that's already telling you that, you know, it's been affected. And, um, you know, these, these are from Rutgers, Obsession, Devotion, Thunderstruck, and Passion Basil. Uh, you can buy, I think one variety is sold at Johnny's. Um, and um, you can try that. I mean, basil is pretty easy to grow from seed. So, um, you know, just get a packet and, and try it this season. You may still get a little bit of it, but, but it may be a little bit better. And it's uh, the one that they sell is like Hi. Genovese uh, basil. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Where do you buy Johnny's seeds? Uh, you have to buy them by mail. You have, oh. to, you have to go at, at their website and um, they have a lot of different seeds. So um, a lot of variety of seeds and, and they're pretty quick. I mean, they do charge shipping for, uh, uh, for sending you a packet of seeds, but you know, it's, you could, you could, you could save your seeds from year to year. So it's not a big deal to Thank save you. a little bit more, more money. Can you buy any of these varieties locally that you know of, or do you need to uh, So far, not yet. I don't believe so. Um, I don't believe so. No, because I think it was a kind of an exclusive kind of, kind of relationship with them. Um, because, you know, they had to first, you know, work with them and then they had to find a way to sell them. So uh, I, think, I think right now it might be only Johnny's that sells them. What does your whirly gig look like? Oh, it's a, it's just a little like, a, um, I bought several types, one that looked like a little flower and one that looks like a little wind thing. So it just spins around uh, okay. I on, the, on my deck rail and it spins. So uh, the birds can't get, it's, it's not too big, but the birds can't get near it. So it's, uh, you could, you could also try streamers, you know, just um, something to just keep them away. Thank you. Okay. You mentioned something shiny would keep deer away. Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't I'm... think so. <laughs> they're they're pretty <laughs> awful. I don't think I'm just away. trying to find a way to keep the deer from eating everything that's on my patio. <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, with a patio, you you can't. They're gonna come up. Those those yes, nasty creatures. <laughs> Unless, unless you could somehow, uh, I don't know if you could fend, put a, a, you know, you could buy some cages maybe, um, see if maybe a cage around it could help. Yeah, that's you could you could put a gate. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, we had a we have a deck that has a came with a, a gate I think to keep the kids from going down the steps, mm -hmm. but but maybe that would our our deck is up high. I never had a deer up there, but yeah. I've had raccoons come up. Yep, yep. And, a gro and one day I saw a groundhog five feet up. Yeah. Off the yeah, ground and we, do, we do have groundhogs too. Yeah. Amazing. Mm. But you can buy this pretty strong fence because I do put some fences around some plants that I, you know, the deer lettuce, for example, hostas, right? So I like, I have a shady spot and I want to put hosta there. So I just buy that heavy duty um, fencing material and, you know, with some stakes, you can just wrap it around. So perhaps you could do the same thing with, with your pots, just That's true. Create, create a fence around them mm -hmm. because you know, they're, they'll be discouraged um, with a, like a four foot fence because they can't stick their neck in there too well. Do you, uh, do you recommend using that deer and rabbit you know, spray that smells like urine? Well, I, I I do use it. I, I use it on, on plants, you know, like on... on um, I use it on my hosta and, yeah. and, and some of my lilies. I have mostly flowers and that really helps. 
Yeah, I've used it too, and it does help. I mean, I would certainly wouldn't put it on vegetables, but um, the deer are have a pretty sensitive nose and they don't like anything. Mine smells fishy and ugh. So I usually try to go out once a week and just put a very light coating around them. Um, and they seem to stay away from them. And then of course, you know, you have to plant um, deer resistant plants. I mean, my yard is loaded with daffodils and, and have a huge yeah. number of irises now because I just keep transplanting them, but all the beautiful flowers of summer, you just can't grow them unless you keep spraying them. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's, an, it's unfortunate. I love Hunterdon County, but I, I hate the deer. I do too, thank you. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have questions? This is great. Well, well, we'll let you um, enjoy the rest of your evening, Vicki. Thank you so much. This is great help. And, and for all the visuals, um, I'm talking about the basil, the picture you have up now. I know I've had that issue in other years. I hope I don't have it this year, but I didn't know what it was and it, it came on suddenly. So um, thank you for bringing all this great information to us and, uh, and happy gardening, everybody.